What's up, comrades? Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. It's time, once again, for our Capitalism and Desire reading series. We're here. We're going to be plowing with McGowan into Chapter 5 on God, the Market, Freedom, the Symbolic, all sorts of other good Lacanian, and all sorts of other good Lacanian spicy, icy cold content. That's it. Nothing fancy today. We're just going to get right down to business. One quick technical issue we had during this week's recording. You know, we're pushing our technical limits sometimes on the show with the equipment that we have. And unfortunately, for the first about 20 minutes or so of today's episode, Comrade Commissar Alex's mic mysteriously stopped working and we didn't catch it for quite some time. So whenever Alex is going to be speaking, you're going to hear him being picked up on some of the other mics, and it's still very listenable. You should be able to catch everything that he's saying. We did some really hard editing work to make it salvageable, and it's going to get resolved as soon as we catch it in the episode, and we're going to do our best to make sure that doesn't happen again. If you are new to Red Library, or even if you're an old comrade, an old friend, remember If you'd like to support the work that we're doing here, week in and week out, to join our growing, revolutionary, podcasting leftist army, whatever that means, we provide you a number of options. If you'd like to support us materially, remember, head over to Patreon. And that is essentially www.patreon.com slash redlibrarypodcast, and you should find us, no problem. And for as little as $1 a month, that is less than a quarter an episode, you can get access to all of our premium content. That includes at least one patron-only episode every month, access to our Discord server where we ship posting, we're talking about dialectical pessimism, we do movie nights, we do reading groups, and who knows what else. It's a hell of a lot of fun over there. Remember to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. If you're listening on iTunes, go down, give us one of those star reviews if you feel so inclined. Maybe write us a line or two. And, you know, just keep spreading the show around. Spreading the gospel of dialectical pessimism. Remember that Red Library is part of the Lost Horizons Podcasting Network, a collection of shows focused on developing the dialectical pessimist perspective that includes us, our podrads over at The Regrettable Century, and From 78. Remember, we have a monthly roundtable discussion with a varying cast of characters from all the shows talking about all sorts of things related to politics, philosophy, psychoanalysis, and all that other good stuff. You can find a link for that in the show notes or just search on your favorite podcasting app. Well, here we are still, after all. One last special thing about this particular episode of Capitalism and Desire. After Podrad Neil had to take off the red troika, as we are prone to do, decided to continue the conversation, to bullshit, to hang out, to talk more about our thoughts and reflections on the chapter for almost an hour. And we are releasing that as a special patron-only episode. So if you'd like to hear more of our thoughts on freedom, existentialism, revolutionary violence, and all sorts of other good stuff, remember, head over to Patreon, and for $1 a month, you can get access to that along with everything else. And it's looking like that might be a regular thing with our reading series episodes on McGowan. All right, here we go, Plowing with McGowan, Chapter 5. We'll see you back here afterward. I was uh, trying to think of some version of the jammin' with mammon phrase, but for McGowan. McGowan. Do y'all got any ideas? So we, we need it to rhyme. Plowing. Plowing with McGowan. Plowing yeah. with McGowan. There it is. All right. Plowing with McGowan, oh, part yeah. five. It's, uh, it's all the comrade commissars in the house. It's been a while since we've done a McGowan episode. Yeah. So here we're, we are still. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Don't call it a comeback. I'm not going to call it a comeback because we didn't really go anywhere. We just had other shit. No, I don't understand. <laughs> That's why I said don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't you dare call it a comeback. I won't accept you calling this a comeback. So, all right. It's uh, Red Troika. It's Comrade Adam. It's Comrade Don. Comrade uh, Alex. I'm Neil. The eminent Comrade Commissar Neil. Honorary Comrade Commissars. Oof, I don't know. Do we? Uh, it's been a while since we did the last one. Does anyone have any... Does anyone even remember what Wait, the what, chapter was? What book are we reading? I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> so damn long. What type of podcast is this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so last time we talked about what was it? What was the last? Chance? We talked about sacrifice last. Sacrifice, time. sacrifice yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some, yeah. some shit about sacrifice. Some batai. That's right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. solar anus. That's what we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> he just uh, rem- remembers that. Yeah. <laughs> we just read story of the eye together. <laughs> 
Hey man, just be careful where you stick those eggs, dude. They, they break. This chapter is called A God We Can Believe In. And I think here McGowan just decides to try to tackle the idea of the market in capitalism as uh, what has come to replace sort of an old world faith in, in God as like the guarantor of our decisions of our of our lives you know um, we were talking before about how most people are unaware of the sacrifices that capitalism kind of implicates them to make and how recognizing those sacrifices already sort of being inherent to capitalism can keep us from or maybe could, could radically change our perspective on uh, the necessity of, of sacrifice in, in capitalism. I don't know, I guess we're transitioning from the idea of sacrifice to the idea of God, him or her, or whatever itself. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, don't know, I, I need to be PC here. Um, I don't, don't want to get called out. Um, but <laughs> yeah, he just, he, you know, he starts off in this first part uh, where he, he talks about it's called not God but another. And in essence, uh, McGowan is arguing that. Um, the defining feature of our like era today is that that position of authority that originally was inhabited by God has been replaced by the sort of chaotic uh, unpredictability of markets. And that whereas subjects used to be sub subordinated to God and they did not experience freedom, there's like all of these discussions of like uh, free will, you know, in the old old world theological discussions like Marcus Aurelius or I don't know, I guess Kant was struggling with this as well. Yeah, actually, could we hold on? Hopefully sure. For a second. Okay, because I, I wanted to bring this quote in from McGowan, and I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Very end of the first paragraph says, Freedom is only thinkable without the presence of a divine force active in the world. The sentence right before that, I think, is also key, though, right? The absence of God in capitalist modernity creates the space in which subjects can, for the first time in human history, believe in a freedom without contradiction. Then, you know, the, the sentence that Don said, freedom is only thinkable without the presence of a divine force active in the world. Yeah, I mean, do you guys think that that's accurate? I think that when I was reading this chapter, it's, it's super fascinating to me because what this makes me think about is something that I, I see in psychoanalysis all the time. In doing psychoanalysis, I see this a lot. You know, people want there to be a guarantee. They want a guarantee that things are gonna be okay. They want to guarantee that they're doing the right thing. They want to guarantee that there's a happy ending to their story. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence that would suggest that a happy, that, that everything is provisional, right? And the ending, I, I would argue, is not happy for anybody. So it's always, I think, tragic. But there's still this desire to have this guarantee. And I think what McGowan's pointing out here, you know, is that for a long time, there was this idea of God that fulfilled this very strong desire for there to be a guarantor of one's position in the world. When people were doing things, if they, you know, it starts when we're kids, we want to be able to, to do what we want. We believe that we're powerful. We realize we're not. And we believe, okay, my parents are powerful. Then we realize that they're just mortals too. And then it, you need something else. For some people, that's God. But you always need something to play that part. And what McGowan's bringing up here is that capitalism sort of takes that out of the mix and it, it makes me wonder about what that what that does I, we can see it you know historically the effect that this has had but it's a really interesting thing to look at what happened in the you know post death of god world that nietzsche proclaimed in, in different points that's kind of where i was thinking with it so i want to ask kind of two questions about this one the idea is that without god or in the capitalist world we can believe mm -hmm. in freedom without contradiction so i want to understand with God, how would we then think, how is McGowan describing what freedom with contradiction would be? Because that's my read of that is like, if there is God, like God has not died and we haven't killed him yet, that means that freedom is a, like we experience it as a contradiction. So maybe we can unpack that for a second. I have an idea, but I'm, I mean, I'm not exactly sure if, it, if we're going to have to talk about Kantian freedom or all different other sorts of modes of thought about freedom. I, I was just gonna say, I think that, that there's definitely a degree to which we, we might have to like invoke someone like Kant or, you know, like uh, McGowan himself talks about Descartes and Descartes' postulation that uh, <laughs> kind of like the spirit molecule, right? Like the idea that like, <laughs> that, like the uh, pineal gland or whatever mm -hmm. is like this go between, between God and the human, the individual or whatever subject. And like, you kind of, have these mediations between that force of like omnipotence and like the singular or like the subject or whatever. And I think that obviously not uh, a solution that we necessarily sit with today, unless you're like some kind of weird dualist revivalist. But like, 
I think that that's not a that's a question that was constantly grappled with by like theology, but was never really. Mm-hmm. I don't think ever like succinctly put to bed like this is how God still allows for our freedom and like you know maybe there are like prevailing answers that like different religions might provide to a question like that, but I don't think that that's necessarily anything that we <laughs> ever succinctly answered. I, I don't know. As, did we? I don't know. What do you think, Don? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I highlighted this because I didn't really agree with McGowan here. Um, I feel like there was a lot of debates in um, in medieval Christianity about our, you know, free will versus determinism. And I don't really think that those have necessarily gone away. Like, I don't really mm-hmm. think that we have, like, depending on how he means freedom, and I guess that that's kind of why I was bringing it up, because I wanted to hear what you guys thought about what he meant by freedom. But if what he means is free will, I don't really think that those problems have been resolved under under capitalism or under like a world without the divine either so i feel like those problems still remain yeah it's an interesting an interesting point to bring up because like one thing i it immediately made me think of when you said that was this book by paul vane and it's mm-hmm. like do the did the ancient greeks believe in their gods oh hell and yeah so there's this like interesting question of like when we attribute to historically like whatever pre-modern societies uh, that they just had some kind of like devotion and faith to their understanding of what god was or like their religious beliefs so that like we sort of attribute that to them but that maybe there was a degree to which they were also self-aware of like that's not really something i'm completely devoted to but rather just something i recognize that has like a social function or like it's some kind of like political stand-in you know or something like maybe it isn't necessarily like a question of do i have freedom but rather more like that's only like what the theologians and like the deep academics mm-hmm. were thinking about well the common person was like well of course i don't really think Jesus is like risen from the dead or something like that, you know, like, I don't know, maybe. I will say really quickly that that book is referenced pretty heavily by Robert Fowler in uh, his writings on interpassivity. So Neil, before I ask my second question, I was curious what you thought about that or or sort of what freedom with contradiction means for McGowan. I don't know if I'm going to be able to uh, to make this this make sense, but I'm I'm really going to try here. The way I, I imagine this is McGowan is making an argument, I think, that says in a world where there where God was in the world, there was a limit that was imposed by that God or by the mortal agents of that God, the, the church, so on and so forth. Um, they said, this is the law and these are what you need to do in order to have eternal life. Um, uh, in addition to that, I, I mean, the, the church was the, you know, the institution that really kind of like guaranteed the state, like monarchs got their the divine right of kings, you know, came from the church uh, and all that. So there, there was, there was very much this, this idea that there was the law and the law was a limit. And what McGowan is saying is that that, that hard limit, that very, very, very apparent, unignorable limit actually made people more free as opposed to less free. And the way that, that it made them more free is that when there's a limit, you have a choice about whether or not you will transgress it or obey it. You, you get to decide one way or the other which one you'll do. But that's that's a choice that the subject make in relationship to the, the, the law, the wall, the, the demand. When capitalism comes in, it basically tears down the walls. It rips up the law and replaces it with, there's a, a whole bunch of a law, right? Like you, you have your law and I have my law and she has her law and those folks over there, they got their law. It's all good, you know? There's not, and nothing's really bad, it's just, do what you do what you want to do do what makes you happy enjoy yourself so when when capitalism comes in and if it functions the way that i just described and it does tear down the limiting walls in the way that i described people no longer have the freedom to transgress the limits or at least to or to attempt to transgress the limits they they can't transgress because there's no more limit so the the absence of limit paradoxically in a, in a contradictory way in a dialectical way dialectical fingers for you adam actually is something that provides people with a choice that they they don't have in the absence of limit. I yeah. think that's how what how he means it. It's an interesting way to frame it because this is why Zizek inverts the thing from Ivan Karamazov. It's originally if God is dead everything is permitted. Zizek inverts that for this reason and says if God is dead nothing is permitted for this very reason. I guess this kind of does lead to my second question which just might be an open-ended one. You know we're reading through Enchantments of Mammon and I can't help but take a sentence like this. So this is McGowan at the bottom of 114. 
He says, the free market replaces God and acts as the other, with a capital O, as a social authority in capitalist modernity. Like God, it tells subjects what to desire and directs their actions, but it does so in a surreptitious fashion. And so I, I'm kind of curious now that we're doing this chapter after reading that book, at least some, is McCarahare's way of describing it is not so much like God is dead, it's that we have misenchanted the capitalist social order and the economy with this sort of like divine power but we don't name it as su- it's like we talk about it as if it has all these qualities we just don't call it like you know the market is god with the capital g so i'm just sort of curious now to like put together a psychoanalytic read of god and the market with mccarrier and and the idea that like it isn't this thing of like there is god or not god it's more of like the the whole like mystical theological way that we structure our experience or that is part of our experience is now just like projected into capitalism in a different way this is the the interesting component of it right you can take jesus christ and use him as the best example of somebody who used his freedom to transgress a limit and doing so literally destroyed him right it, it ended his life that the transgressions that, that he took part in but he chose them uh, according to this the, the idea is that that when somebody does that when somebody chooses to transgress a limit um a lot of times that that does result in a, a very 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 significant punishment being enacted upon their body including the death of their body but then you see what happens after, right? It, it actually turns into an event, uh, a truth procedure, and, and everything is different afterwards. I would say that, that what McGowan's doing here is, is this is more of like a Hegelian read when you're, you're talking about Zizek. I mean, Zizek's doing the same kind of, I think, Hegelian thing. And it's the bringing in what, you know, the good infinite, right? The You have an infinite number of options within these limits as opposed to the bad infinite, which is just keep adding one, mm-hmm. and, and which is what capitalism, I think, is what he, McGowan in this chapter and in this book is suggesting that's what it does, right? It just is like, yeah, there's nothing that's really off limits. You can do whatever you want. So if nothing's off limits, then nobody's free, you know, as, as you pointed out earlier. But when you do have limits being imposed in the form of, of God or something else, it could be the state, but that actually, it's weird and it's it's hard to say this. And I, I think that this is a, a thing I've, I've had discussions with people and, and I know a lot of people just hardcore disagree with this, that, that limits actually create freedom. They think that's like some weird Orwellian newspeak, you know, uh, war is freedom kind of kind of yeah. stuff. And so I, I think that it's a really interesting topic to bring up. And, you know, I don't think we're going to solve it here today, but but this is this is something that's just really important that I think everybody should be talking about a lot more than they are. Yeah, I, I like absolutely agree with you, Neil, about the, the idea of like um, limits being important to freedom itself, because I think, you know, what we think is that by destroying that obstacle to freedom in the form of limits that what we'll get is just like unrelenting freedom but what you actually lose is like the point of reference for freedom itself at all like it it itself and so it just becomes like a much more desperate kind of like what uh, Adam was bringing up the Zizek quote earlier about how once God is dead nothing is permitted right because the ground that you thought you had to stand on that you were going to be able to like walk without God watching you is like no longer there for you to stand on so it just becomes like everything uh it becomes a prohibition but like i I wanted to like make a a reference back to the text because i think it's an interesting point that mcgowan starts with here because he's basically saying with like the copernican uh this like heliocentric idea right he's kind of making an example of like when that idea was challenged there was a backlash from the church that was like very palpable you know because like the standards for the ideals that were being held by universally or like whatever supposedly universally by all of the authorities at that time like held this to be true and then when that that notion of like heliocentrism was challenged then it became like an assault on the nature of god itself right that like you were challenging the the basis for authority that we carry right and he's kind of saying well we we wouldn't really experience that today right like um it's a little different right like if somebody were to argue like flat earth right or something like that and like try to make it into this like revelatory domain of, of, of information even if there were some kind of like true like material basis for which you could claim that it was a flat earth you know i don't think that it would have this like earth shifting or earth shattering effect i think that this is what like those like ancient alien types are constantly trying to do right like sorry i'm always gonna just bring this back to, like, <laughs> all right the, hold on trash. hold on but just but just hear me out guys aliens <laughs> <laughs> like, but like you know i think that that's really that's a kind of an example of this happening like no one wants like i don't know if i'm really using this terminology but no one wants the bone that is spirit right like no one wants 
the thing that you claim there to be, that the, the sort of materiality that all of this implies. I don't know, it's like an interesting example, uh, like from a couple of years ago, a friend had shared with me a video that was on YouTube about um, Atlantis, like the true location of Atlantis. And it was actually like uh, the eye of the Sahara. But basically uh, this big structure in the Sahara in the middle of the desert that's like been abandoned for years, they were kind of making the argument that like it fits the like platonic like is uh, referring back to like one of his ancestors Solon or whatever but he has like a very explicit description mm -hmm. in one of his his writings Plato does of what Atlantis was like the measurements the stadia and like the like like size and this guy like mapped he did the conversions for like the size of the area and like the shape and how it was des described and he like literally like mapped it to this area and he like tried to show like this is really where Atlantis was you guys it's right here we just never knew to look in the desert and like I think it, it's just funny to me how little anyone has cared <laughs> like I, I think it was very convincing the argument was very convincing but I kind of was like everybody's like yeah well, of course man there's just mysteries you know but then it just like <laughs> like business as usual and so please stop us it, before we get on like yeah. hey I saw all these conspiracy <laughs> theory conspiracy. videos on YouTube <laughs> let me tell you about them <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's so good he brought that up because it, it made me remember something. There's a, a book I had to read when I was in grad school. It's uh, by Thomas Kuhn. It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Is this the paradigm know, guy? It, it, what, that's, <laughs> that gets that. Yeah, yeah, paradigm, bro. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. The, the, the paradigms. Everything's about paradigms. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the way I look at this, right, Thomas Kuhn describes that you know, in science, a lot of times somebody will discover something new. You know, the heliocentric model of Copernicus is a really good example. I think in the book he uses x-rays as one of the examples. I'm not sure. I haven't read it in a long time. Hmm. But uh, it, let's just use that kind of in case I'm right. There was this guy who was like, I think I discovered these things called x-rays. And he, was, he wasn't trying to discover x-rays. He was trying to do something else. But x-rays were like shooting off. Like he was trying to shoot something forward. But the x-rays were coming off the sides. And there was photo paper over on his shelves. And he created an x-ray. And he's like, oh, I think I discovered something, that there's more to light than what we think. There's this whole spectrum that's unobservable with just the equipment that we currently have, but it's there. And people were like, this is ridiculous. How dare you say this? You're a fool. Who would believe such a thing? Only an idiot. This is fantastical stuff. Next, you're going to be telling us that you can travel in time. We'll disprove you, right? And they attempted to disprove him, but in attempting to disprove the, the thing, they just ended up actually making more evidence for it is what ended up happening, right? Yeah. The same thing happens with other, other scientific discoveries. But again, this shows when there's this limit, this idea, it's a, it's a thing. It's like, don't go farther than this. Stay in, the, stay in bounds. Don't go over that hill. Don't go over the fence or whatever, because you don't do that. That, that limit is actually really interesting because what it does is innately tempt people to go like, I wonder what's on the other side of that damn hill. But they have to choose freely, you know, to go over it, which is different than just like roaming around and finding something. That, that's not the same thing as going like, I know that somebody has told me that's a bad idea, that's a bad plan, but I'm going to, I think it's worth it. So I'm going to do it. Th this shows things. So that's, I think that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind with this because it, it does show this stuff. It, it also reminds me, you know, in, in the clinical work I do, there's a really common thing that happens where uh, people will come to me for, for parenting advice, and w which is somewhat amusing in and of itself, but they do. And I, I've heard many people say, I don't want to be too strict with rules with my kids because I think if I'm too strict, what will end up happening is my kids will turn into like this terrible, awful, like ultra rebel kind of person. And what I've noticed is that actually the opposite happens. The the parents who take, instead of setting like a reasonable amount of limits for a kid, um, they just kind of like make everything permissible. When a kid needs to go all the way out to murder somebody to transgress, they'll go all the way out to murder somebody. They'll do that. If instead smoking a cigarette in their bedroom is a major transgression, they'll do that. <laughs> and, and I would argue that smoking a cigarette in your bedroom is way better than like going out and doing something that, that's violent towards another human body. But it, it's all about where we put the limits. Those the, where, where those limits are are important because they give people the option of attempting to step over them or staying within them. But that's a that's a choice that people make. When there are no limits, people cannot make that choice. So for you guys, you'd say that like the definition of freedom is specifically transgressing like a, a social um, or like a cultural limit that's been placed on you? I would say so like freedom isn't so much the transgression itself, but rather 
freedom is what is implied by the transgression or like it's the thing that holds the promise of why you might want to transgress it's like the unknown that lies beyond the thing that supposedly keeps you bonded you could say or like bound i don't think that's that's like the only way to define freedom at all right right obviously that's, like yeah, yeah i mean how would you what when when mcgowan is talking about freedom i mean what how would you guys briefly describe how you understand that? This is anonymous. Allow me to hack this conversation and bring it back to the text. Yeah. Bottom of 116. Freedom involves an absence of reliance on the other, capital O, other, as a substantial figure of authority. For the free subject, the other does not have a substantial existence. There is no guarantee undergirding and taking responsibility for the decisions the subject makes. This means that the most significant barrier to freedom is not a member of the police forcing me to eat celery instead of a Twinkie, but a television advertisement telling me that George Clooney, or any representative of social authority, likes Twinkies. Freedom is freedom from the figure of the other, capital O, other, qua social authority, providing an ontological support for my acts. This is a really interesting way to define it, and it's something that actually, Alex, your like catchphrase on Red Library is, there is no, no one who can vouch save your success. <laughs> and I think what, what you're describing when you say that is this conception of freedom, which is a free act is one in which you can engage in that act, or even if it's a transgression of a limit, without needing that undergirding of a sort of like kind of symbolic authority that justifies or sort of validates your decision. I have a feeling you are gonna hate that, mm -hmm. but I feel like that is at least in this conception okay. kind of what it is. I will say one thing I do wanna maybe kind of think about, invoking the figure of the police officer telling you to eat celery instead of a Twinkie is an interesting one here. So let's bring in Big Tony Gramsci. I wanna think about this <laughs> kind of- Kamala Harris. <laughs> no, <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about our queen, Kamala Harris. No, I, so I do think it's interesting because whenever I read that, that passage, my thought was police officer is the figure of coercion in Gramsci's idea of what provides conditions of hegemonic control in a society, right? You gotta have coercion, but you also have consent. And I get a sense that like McGowan's description here is almost how I would describe kind of in some way like what you would do to undermine the functions of hegemonic consent in the social order. So it's almost like, I wonder if it's an interesting way to talk about this is what like a radical act would be thinking about the necessity to, to sort of like negate or transcend the ways that ideological consent functions. And I also just want to kind of invoke, it's like, yeah, but you know, Kamala Harris will still crack you in the head with the billy club and throw you in jail for, you know, <laughs> possessing a small modicum of marijuana too. So. The police coming straight from the underground. so I don't know, I want to think those two together, I guess. I also, I was, before before we kind of got to this, uh, to this definition of freedom we're talking about, I was going to quote the paragraph like immediately before what you quoted, Adam which says that freedom is never simply the freedom to do what one wants. Uh, as thinkers from Plato onward have insisted, what one wants is always socially mediated and thus necessary before it is free. So we don't generate our own wants, but inherit them from our milieu and its constraints. We are never more determined than when we are doing what we want, which is why freedom must not simply be equivalent to the ability to act in any way we please. So I think that that's like also very important to this idea that we're trying to define that like just being able to do what you want isn't actually related to freedom in the truer sense of what freedom should imply like doing what you want is uh, mcgowan says here like always socially mediated and therefore not really your freedom but the freedom of like an other that imp compels you to be free you know so it's just kind of like a form of bondage basically to yeah. like pursue your desires or like not your desires but like your your wants your like immediate wants i mean every decision i make is literally because i check in to see what george clooney would do in that situation <laughs> and then i do whatever george clooney would or do I so. like that, I like <laughs> Or any representative of social authority in parentheses. Yeah. <laughs> Just, <laughs> you want to hear something that, that's uh, some some real confession stuff here? Hell yeah, real yeah, confession I I mean, hours. I've already talked about this. This is probably oldnews.com, so shut me up if it is. Every day I, 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 when I was driving to work on a regular basis, I don't do that now um, because a gesture of the world, um, but uh, I drive past this donut shop and I would, in my head, I'd really want to get a donut and I would imagine present day Morrissey and present day Keanu Reeves fighting for for what kind of body I'm gonna have. And that, that was my way of, of getting myself to drive by. Hell yeah. Because, wow. because you know, I do want to be modern day Keanu Reeves way more than I want to be modern day Morrissey. It's the struggle of the gods in your own soul right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
CC Don, mm. how do you yeah. typically think about freedom compared to this example? Like this. Uh, I mean, I guess part. Like I don't. I don't really understand. Hey, Don, what do you think, Don? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually but do it do it boo boo yeah. do your magic no I mean I don't really under, I don't have a good way of conceptualizing freedom like and like I feel like even this like to me this sounds like a very circular argument right mm-hmm. like it's sort of like oh well freedom like requires there to be like an ability to uh, or like something to transgress and therefore what this means is that transgressing it is necessary to freedom and just like well if you define it that way then sure but like uh yeah i don't know like i i guess i don't really see the o- obeying the limit or transgressing the limit as either one being like more or less mediated i feel like that they're both probably determined by something it's not necessarily the transgression that's what i'm trying it's the option of transgression if there is no limit then there is no option to transgress there is no option to be loyal either you, you only have what there is. If everything is open, there is nothing to stop you from, like, like going anywhere, doing anything, doesn't matter. It's not a free act at that point. Right, I guess, why, why is it necessary for it to be a transgression that it makes it a free act instead of something it that is relative, a, relatively meaningless? But it doesn't need to be a transgression. Choosing to not transgress is also a free right, right. act. But the transgression is necessary, like there needs to be the possibility of a transgression for there to be a free act, right? Yeah, it's like, uh, I think this is a Rosa Luxemburg thing. Tell me if I'm wrong here. You know, freedom is always the ability to think otherwise. Yeah, I think that's so Rosa. It, th- that's the thing here. If there is if there is no barrier, there is no otherwise, right? And, and that that means that you act, but you don't act as a subject. You're just sort of doing stuff. And that that's different than freely choosing to, to do stuff. So I kind of want to read this definition of freedom back against the first four chapters that we've done. So I guess in this kind of conception, I would wonder about if the idea is that we're like pursuing our own dissatisfaction because it's what we really enjoy. To me, I wonder how I would read this concept of freedom along with that. Let's say that you need the possibility to transgress for something to be a free act, right? I'm wondering about whenever we think about like sacrifice or the commodity. I'm wondering if there's a way that McGowan, and maybe if we're gonna operate on that that definition, like the way that we do that is by definition not free because we're not necessarily making a choice to like transgress or not transgress a limit of some kind. I'm not even sure if that makes sense, but I'm kind of thinking about, like I guess my question would be for McGowan in this conception of freedom, is it like you could choose to continue to consume and to participate in commodity fetishism and consumer society in exactly the same way you are now, if you were to do it without that sort of undergirding social authority, like the big O, would that by this definition technically be a free act? You know, to like go buy the the Starbucks coffee, but you know, you're aware that I could transgress the limits in some way, or I could not, I'm choosing to go buy the Starbucks coffee, but I'm not doing it because there's some, like George Clooney isn't hovering over my shoulder looking just completely gorgeous and magical, (laughs) but he's not sitting over my shoulder. (laughs) Like, you know, I need his authority to validate my consumption. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think maybe Don, like another question to to like reflect on is to think like, what would it be? Like if there was no figure of the other, that was like maybe inhibiting or in some way determining for you what it is that you desire. And you really did have that freedom of like, I'm just gonna go do the thing that I think should happen and not be in this like sort of sort of uh, engagement with the big other that we're kind of describing here, that like sort of prohibition that makes you feel like you need to transgress. What would it be exactly that you think that you might do if you didn't have that prohibition? And I think Kant, probably would say that it would, that's like the ultimate ethical injunction, right? Is that if there were no limitations to your uh, ability to act freely, then you should just ultimately do the the perfect ethical thing and just like literally like go out and fix the problems of the world or like fix what you see as like other people's inability to like engage. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and start us back up with a quote that I had marked to talk about because I think it's a really interesting quote. Mm -hmm. And I think that it implicates the other side of this argument, right? The whole point of this is to problematize the idea of freedom as capitalism presents it to us, right? Because that freedom is like a spurious version of freedom and it's something that is like a, like a false 
uh, or like a misnomer. And uh, I think McGowan here is trying to get us to, to sort of recognize in some ways how it's false and why that's important for us as subjects. So I want to go to this uh, on the bottom of 117, or like you know, almost all the way down on 117. Uh, McGowan quotes Alenka Zupancic. Uh, what up, Bay? Yeah, Bay. <laughs> Zupancic recognizes this in her analysis of the Great Leap Forward that Kant accomplishes with his conception of morality. Uh, she argues, that which can in no way be reduced without abolishing ethics as such is not the multicolored variability of every situation, but the gesture by which every subject, by means of his action, posits the universal, performs a certain operation of universalization. Even reason which alerts the subject to the existence of the moral law does not constitute the law or direct its implementation. Instead, the subject must decide for itself. So it's more like trying to redefine freedom from being something that you engage with in this kind of false way of like you somehow trying to transgress or define yourself against the uh, other and what the other wants of you and actually make freedom into something that would be an enormous responsibility for you or something that is like in a sense, what you hope the big other will shield you from, you know? So like, instead of being something that you just freely engage with and you do because like, you feel like, oh, you want this or you want the other thing, freedom is rather something that is enormously intimidating and like an enormous responsibility for the subject because it's like, what is there really to do when you have no basis for defining your own freedom against somebody else and their perspective? And the abyss of that freedom that you would really experience without the other uh, is the thing that we always try to hide from when we rely on an other and their implications of our desire, what our desire should be. So the, the freedom that we normally experience through capitalism is the one where capitalism has sort of said, don't you worry about your responsibility to the world. I'll cover you. Just buy stuff and do, do things within the domain of capitalism and you'll be covered. Um, so that we don't have to engage with that abyssal responsibility of what a real freedom without those constraints would mean. When I listen to this and, and read this, what I, uh, if McGowan were here, what I'd want to ask him about is um, a comparison to the way that he's talking about Kant in this chapter to the way that I think about Jean-Paul Sartre. And McGowan knows a lot about Jean-Paul Sartre too, so I think he'd, he'd probably have a pretty great answer were he here, but he's not. But um, you know, Sartre <laughs> has this idea of we're free to choose at every moment of our life. You can decide for whatever reason, good or bad, crazy or not crazy, that you want your life to be radically different or the same or kind of different. You, you always have this option all the time because you are, you're free to, to choose. You, you get to decide what kind of person you are in, in the world. And this matches up with the way that McGowan writes about Kant, I think, you know, saying that, that for Kant, it's about good and evil. You know, are you going to choose to be good? Or are you going to choose to be evil? And I think that his argument in, in this chapter and in this book is, and I'm going to read something here from page 120, the market replaces God insofar as it tells us what we should desire. But it is an impoverished version of God because it permits us to retain the idea of ourselves as free beings. So what, what I think he's getting at here is that the market, basically capitalist market, creates this situation within which people believe they're they're engaging in kind of some kind of Sartrean freedom. I'm choosing whatever. But in reality you're you're not. The the part that's really interesting I think in our discussion here is the the why aren't you, right? What is it that capitalism does that prevents people you know, from making the choice to be other than, you know, whatever at this point. So that's the question I had for, for all of you to see what you thought about that. I mean, it's an interesting way to invoke, I think, McGowan's own existentialist kind of tendencies in his thought, you know, and he's, he's even said that that his first initial, I think, thing that really grabbed him about philosophy was Sartre and it was existentialism. So I think it's kind of an interesting, uh, like, legacy of that in his thinking. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I feel the same way. I'm, I think I recall listening to McGowan talk about how, for him, Zizek is somebody who actually fits into that existentialist category, but, like, basically not for the same reasons as Sartre is in the existentialist category, but that he has a very similar project of trying to, like, reach the limits of knowledge or something, or, like, the sort of internal, the contradictions of our structural... Because he gets, he gets categorized in really weird ways, and so I think 
I, I don't really remember the specifics, but I do remember McGowan saying that he did have that perspective on Zizek, that he was related to Sartre in that like existentialist vein. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, I relate to that too. I think it resonated with me because I think that's Sartre was somebody that I was always super interested in. Existentialism um, was something I was always really interested in. And I think Robert Solomon was somebody that I was like reading and was like, oh, wow, this is really it. it the, that idea of like responsibility, that whole thing that I've been saying about Um, the implication that the big other protects you from, you know, that comes almost directly from Robert Solomon and these ideas of, in in his, like, formulations about existentialism that, you know, it's not like some form of nihilism, but it's rather something that implicates you very deeply uh, on the level of responsibility. And so heavy resonant energy. Well, (laughs) big big resonance (laughs) energy. Yeah, Yeah. big resonance energy. I feel my spirit molecules flowing. I'm going to paste in some tool behind me because we're unified into one universal mind. I mean, no, it's interesting because, you know, Frederick Jameson once said that at different points in sort of political and economic shifts historically, that there tends to be this sort of emphasis on material, historical developments and relations of production, but at other times, times whenever potentially the possibility of like a rupturing political moment, right, like a capital E event for Badiou, like May 68 or something, that you tend to see people really gravitate much more towards things related to existentialism, like revolutionary subjectivity. And so I wonder if like part of the reason why, you know, McGowan is such an important thing to to engage with right now is maybe because we're also kind of living through one of those moments think about like the uprisings going up all over the world right now around like blm and and i think this emphasis on an existentialist kind of approach to freedom you know might actually be a very you know big resonant energy thing with the bigger historical conditions we're in i mean i i will tell you i mean i i'm also always very sympathetic to existentialist views because the first person that got me into marxism was eric Fromm, Mm. and eric Fromm's whole project is about all the ways that we escape from freedom how totalitarianism or like fascism or any kind of like massive collectivist kind of project, obviously thinking about like Stalinism and like the USSR, those were in a sense escapes from this sort of uh, radical and groundedness of our freedom. I mean, I think there's a way that there's a history of engaging with this, even from like the more Marxist perspective of like really emphasizing this necessity of thinking the individual's freedom this way. I actually wanted to read a quick quote. This is at the bottom of 120. Uh, He says, "Uh, that is the capitalist other capital O other, unlike God, doesn't force us to question how we could reconcile freedom and the other's omnipotence, which is basically what the older, more like Christian theological conception of freedom does for him. He says, and yet the market relieves us from our freedom much more effectively than God. God leaves room for doubt, whereas the market rarely does. And I thought that was a really interesting aspect of this very existentialist way of thinking about it, because, you know, for Kierkegaard, kind of by a lot of people considered the first existentialist, the whole point was like, True faith is defined by doubt, right? And and I think that Sartre's conception of freedom also has to have that. Like you have to understand that every choice you make has to be defined by a doubt about whether this is actually the right decision or not. I was gonna make uh, read a quote from just like from my notes. It might be uh, partially quoting some of the text, but McGowan goes through kind of like this whole the whole uh, name of this section is is the poverty of freedom, and so I feel like it's McGowan kind of disambiguating the way that freedom doesn't really mean what we really think it is or re- what it does and like how the market exploits that from us or like sort of comes to our rescue in a sense uh, with regard to that freedom. And uh, he says, the horror of the absence of the other isn't that we don't know what it wants, rather that it, the non-existent other, doesn't know what it wants. And, and thus we are forced by implication to disambiguate its desire. Here, the market intervenes quote unquote, on our behalf and generates an internal logic of the fluctuations of desire and quote unquote, saves us from uh, this horrific freedom. So once again, like the market is like intervening on our behalf to like keep us from having to engage with the ambiguity of uh, what the other's desire would be or like what what we should want after when in the absence of like the the monarch, right? Um, there was another quote from way before that I wanted to say because I felt like it kind of was like a small step from what we were talking about, but basically like, this is at the top of 116. It is just a small step from the displacement or spiritualization of God to the freedom that makes it uh, that makes possible the execution of the monarch. He's, he's basically saying that once we have pulled away from the sort of like 
prohibitive law of, of old and moved into this new domain of like a sort of relativism of the law that we we it's a very short step to like completely eliminate the existence of a central body of authority altogether or like whatsoever and that's kind of like how the market like is able to come in and intervene on our behalf giving us all of these like sort of justified or logical formulations of like what we should seek you know he makes the example of like when you graduate from high school and you're thinking about what I would like to do as a career and then you sort of weigh your options of like oh well I could be a musician but like you know the payout is possibly not super high and like I'd have to dedicate a lot of time to this and you know who knows I'm never, I might never make it or like oh I could be a, like a like a market analyst you know and like oh there's always work in that you know or like I could be whatever like a, <laughs> like a teacher or something but like once again I'd sacrifice so there's like an internal logic of a system that you're engaging with that saves you from that like ambiguity or that like sort of scary feeling that you get when it is up to you to decide something for yourself I mean I don't know maybe some people when they're young they have like a deep passion that they've always wanted but I feel like the vast majority of us are just sort of like kind of floating along and we go like, okay, well now I gotta pick something, you know, that I wanna do that's gonna pay my bills or like you let me have a family or whatever it is that I'm trying to do. You know, he's kind of making the argument that the market is the thing that provides the logic of like what you should choose to invest your time and energy in to like be able to have that payout at the end of like a good job or like a good life, you know. I actually did want to talk about this section. I think it's like what you're talking about is the bottom of one twenty one. And in the, in the top of 122 is kind of where he's talking about different careers and how we pick them. Because I think for a, a larger part of this chapter, right, he's comparing it or contrasting it with like an earlier form of like medieval Christianity or something like that. Obviously, the argument is not that there was somehow more choice for a career under medieval Christianity, I'm assuming, right? No. So, no, so no, yeah. Uh, right. I, I didn't think so. Because um, that wouldn't, wouldn't make a lot of sense. No. <laughs> no um, definitely not. I, I've kind of read this and I was like, I don't, I get that a lot of people would be, would like agree with this idea that the, the market appears to offer us options, right? Yeah. But then actually doesn't. It does yeah. like funnel us into a certain, certain careers that are lucrative or something like that. I guess like for me, when I read this, like, it was more of, is it really a question of like choice when it comes to careers or is it really, is it more about like, to me, my criticism of capitalism necessarily wouldn't be that it, that people can't just pursue whatever career they want. Cause I have a really hard time imagining a system that allows for that. But I would say like, uh, wouldn't it be about like what goals our labor is put towards and like how much it dominates our lives? Like when, like sometimes I get a little turned around in the argument that he's actually making here. This is on page 125. McGowan in this setup here, he's talking about how advertising affects things. I'm going to attempt to tie this into what you were just bringing up, Don. McGowan says, when I'm drinking a certain kind of beer, I don't necessarily imagine myself surrounded by adoring women, but I do imagine the big other seeing my choice and approving it. The advertisement tells me that my choice has the big other's stamp of approval, and the best advertisement enables the subject to disavow this reliance on the other's approval at the same time they offer it most thoroughly. What I think is, is going on here is that under a different a previous version of their, a different version of the big other, the, the God version of the big other, there, there was this idea that certain things were just like right or, and certain things were just wrong. I, I do think that the, per, the amount of resources a person had influenced that to a degree, like or influenced how a church held them accountable or didn't hold them accountable. But the, the rules were, were far more uh, established. And as a result, people couldn't imagine that if they, if they did something that, that God would be okay with it uh, in certain instances, right? They, they would just not have that as an option. What he's getting at here is that under capitalism, when the capitalist other replaces, uh, well, I guess what we call like the Christian other, the capitalist other is very approving and approves of almost everything we do. We can even go right now mm -hmm and buy books that say how to be an anti-capitalist. We buy them. We go to the to, to amazon.com and get books from Verso or what other leftist publisher you, you want to pick here, which is a total participation in the the capitalist system. But we get the we're like, "Oh, look at us being, you know, lefty rebel, you know, reading our books and talking about it on a podcast that we're probably, you know, paying a hosting company to host and we bought all this, these headphones and these microphones. Like, so really are we, you know, that's what I think he's getting at here. And, and I think his argument is that under previous systems, it was just more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult 
to engage in this sort of like delusional uh, disavowal of what it is that you're doing and what it is that you're participating in ultimately. So I don't know if that actually gets at what you're talking about or even if three of you would agree with that read or not, but that's how I'm looking at it. To branch off of that a little bit, like at the end of that paragraph that we're talking about from 121 going into 122, he ends it by saying, right, the free market rescues me from the horrible freedom of having no grounds for deciding what I desire to take up as an occupation. And at least like when I read that, I don't know if I didn't understand what he's trying to say or if I just disagreed with it. Both are very, very possible. One is he being like somewhat tongue in cheek when he says it rescues me from the horrible freedom of having no grounds or is he like actually, uh, is he basically saying that this is operating subconsciously? I don't know. I guess I feel like for myself and I know plenty of people who like actually did have something that they very much wanted to do and the market prevented them from from doing that. Yeah. So like, I don't know if his argument is that those people never really wanted to do that. Yeah, um, that's the thing that I was going to yeah. say to you okay. before, Don, when you because you brought up something that I think is actually really interesting because it's a very like, I don't know, like materialist perspective. Mm-hmm. Like you kind of are saying like, I don't know if the problem is so much that we don't have the recognition of how capitalism is not really giving us freedom, but mm-hmm. rather like we are bound to the way that capitalism is like forcing us into certain like Mm. domains and like exploiting our labor and like like sort of like uh, making us conform to certain life expectations because otherwise we would have no real choice and we Mm -hmm. would be suffering much much more if we didn't engage in that way and like I kind of feel like that's part of what McGowan is trying to talk about is that what is is being sold to you as your freedom to choose Mm -hmm. is really something that is just like a set of like you could say like a a catechism of capitalism that is just like defining for you what is appropriate in the ways that you live your life and what isn't but instead of being based on like an idea of like overall goodness or like a devout faith or something it's more like just based on the stupid practicalities of like um, well, if you don't do it, you'll be fucked, you know, mm-hmm. or like if you if you choose this then you're going to lose like a bunch of money or like your future as a like a side hustler or like a, a you know, embar- temporarily embarrassed on- entrepreneur is going to be like taken away from you, you know, mm-hmm. to a certain degree. So like it is a part of this. He's definitely focusing on the side of it that is like I- implicated in the decision making process. And like it's he's talking about it with regard to freedom and stuff. But I think that he's absolutely trying to get at that. This is a system that is more a system of limitations than it is a system of opportunities. Like, would you say that if someone already recognized the system as, as like having those limitations, that the system wasn't one of freedom, but was one of restriction, that McGowan, like what McGowan is trying to say here, doesn't, like that they've already kind of seen what he's trying to say um, and what he's addressing is specifically people who see um, and would still claim that the market is one of like absolute freedom. I would agree to the point that like, yeah, this is definitely an argument that's being framed for the people who I haven't already identified this. Okay. But I also think that the argument still applies even for the people who have identified it. Kind of like what Neil was saying just now. Okay. Of like, even though we like ourselves think of ourselves as like, leftists and we're talking about you know Mm -hmm. things that need to be changed or like we're trying to criticize capitalism there's a there's definitely a market for this right like there Mm -hmm. there are people that are willing to give their hard-earned dollars and like this is actually like a viable medium through which we could like make a career Mm -hmm. possibly you know if we did it well enough (laughs) like i don't think i'm not hell yeah yeah. yeah. hell yeah (laughs) chapo Chapo, we're coming to you you, next chapo what's up Uh, like i don't it's not anyway but like i like seriously like we're like in our we're like in our underwear you know um but anyway like we uh (laughs) all all i'm saying is like there's a degree to which the implication still applies the implication of like the big other and having a relationship to this system of of capitalism like the the market fluctuations that we're kind of talking about being the organizing feature of this of this freedom that we have but that really exists more as limitations it also applies on on our side of things where you know we may recognize explicitly that we don't want to be that but we also still do the thing. And in fact, I think Zizek makes light of this a lot of the time. Like, he always goes back to that Marx quote of like, they don't know what they are doing, but they are doing it. And he kind of tries to imply that it's not so much that they're just like blindly doing something and they have no idea. It's rather that they are doing something and they explicitly recognize that they don't know that they're doing it. So like the recognition is in what they abscond from their own activity or like from their own consciousness right that like they know full well that like the dollar itself has no value it's just a stupid piece of green paper but yet 
the entire life that they've built around spending the dollar is something that we all assume has to be there in order for us to have this like freedom to be like, who cares about this stupid dollar? I'll burn one right now. You know, Adam, I feel so, like you wanted uh, to say something for quite well, a while. Well, it's this interesting because it's actually reminding me of where we ended probably by the time this comes out, our last Lost Horizons uh, discussion, which was the relationship between the political economy and the libidinal economy. I think what might be helpful here is to step back and think about that the framework that McGowan is, is using to apply to the market and to capitalism is what I would say is called the symbolic in Lacanian psychoanalysis. The symbolic is the thing that provides the, the sort of like spectral illusion that there's a capital O other. So I actually think it might be helpful to lay out his argument. So Neil, I saw you twitch your eyes. So it's okay, you can correct me if you want in a second. But I do think that McGowan is explicitly drawing on the register of the symbolic to frame capital's functioning and the market's functioning in this way. I think it would actually be helpful to say, okay, well, like, what is what is the symbolic? And maybe that'll help clarify why McGowan is taking this particular tack. So explain the symbolic to me or I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was like, this is, this is, I, I'm interested to see how this goes because like, I think that how Alex uh, interprets what I'm about to say because I really don't know how you're going to interpret this. I think I really disagree with that, actually, what Adam just said here. I think that the symbolic is the thing that says no to the other. That That is what I would say it's primary function is. Um, the other is more implicated in the imaginary, in my read of it, the big other. And people, the capitalism is really good at, at, at creating this sort of like imaginary identification with the big other. And I believe what McGowan is doing here is he's, by describing it in this way, is he's using the symbolic as a way to say no to the other ultimately so i don't know if, if that's what you're saying yeah but I don't, I don't think that's kind of what you're going with it it's it's like um to maybe make this a little bit more simple uh, for me uh i think the imaginary is very much the the primary register of the big other and i think that the symbolic is the primary register of the name of the father okay so can we just maybe for clarity's sake, quick and dirty. What is the symbolic? The symbolic is something that that comes in and castrates. I'll use developmental theory here. Uh, a child is in the imaginary when they believe that they can merge with the the mother, right? It, the the other slash mother figure, and the name of the father comes in with the symbolic order and severs the link between the child and the mother not necessarily by by castrating the child alone but also by saying no to the mother by saying no to the other no you will not take your desire and place it upon this child I, that that is not allowed by me i will use the symbolic order to prevent your desire from being the child's desire uh, this, this, this could be like a, a huge rabbit hole i think if, if, if we go it's, down this yeah it's I'll, interesting i think it's yeah i mean i, I wouldn't and i don't know I, I agree with like what you're saying neil i just i think that like for me it's like much less i like it's it's just something that it's the domain within which we are no longer operating outside which of huh, the symbolic the domain of the symbolic is is a dom domain in which we are no longer operating with the potential for moving in and out of this like this space of freedom that we're talking about here that like is primarily something that is an illusion that is cast by the imaginary kind of like what Neil is saying but rather the symbolic is once we have like sort of concretized and like accepted the new rule of law which is like this tumultuous market freedom that we have to, of today like the symbolic is the domain uh, that we've entered into where we've like severed with our ability to get beyond the sort of limitations of capitalism and we have to operate within its bounds. It's kind of the reason why when we recognize explicitly that we are operating within the bounds of capital and that we're like participating in its logic that we don't see a horizon within which we can just shed that that like format and like move into a way that we wouldn't be operating in this horizon. It's the thing that absconds the possibility of having the freedom uh, that the imaginary is implying could be there in a certain way that's false. Okay, so this is actually the reason I brought this up because the way that McGowan is talking about freedom and the law and the sort of like the limit functioning is grounded in a, in a Lacanian understanding of how the symbolic and the imaginary and, and like how these things function. So the reason I brought that up is I know it's like, pos I mean, it's a huge rabbit hole. I just think that looking at this from this like kind of like the material standpoint of like what are the pressures that the market puts upon me right to like eat and like be able to survive i think 
to me it might be helpful and for listeners too to just recognize that if you're not familiar with like the way that in Lacanian thinking you would the function of the symbolic and how this thing happens like the father coming in and saying no severing the link between the mother and the child and the way that that's like the name of the father-in-law I to me I read this I'm like oh yeah like McGowan's using an understanding of the symbolic to describe the way that the market kind of how these operations kind of work so I wanted to just throw that out there to see if it might help clarify why is McGowan coming at it this way? Why is he emphasizing these particular things about the market as opposed to like maybe a more like kind of materialist analysis? I think that that's the thing though. When he's talking about the way that that God used to function, God used to function as part of the symbolic order Mm -hmm. as a a name of the father, right? And and it basically said, no, (laughs) you you will not place your your desire uh, upon somebody there. And and, I mean, it's weird because the symbolic order, of course, can be tyrannical. But what what I think is is oftentimes missed in people's understanding of the symbolic is I think a lot of people see it as as like only all about castration. And it's about the thing that, that castrates the subject by bringing the subject into the symbolic order. And it definitely does do that. But the part that gets overlooked is the ways in which the symbolic order also says no to the big other and to the, the big other's desire specifically i think and, and that's a really important thing here it seems to me that what mcgowan is doing here is he's using the symbolic because he's writing a book he's using words he's using signifiers and he's putting them together in a certain way and in doing that he's actually saying no to the desire of capitalism okay the the the, the, ca- the big other of capitalism he's saying no it's a great intervention, in my opinion. Yeah, I was gonna, I mean, maybe this is jumping ahead because it's like, you know, getting into the last section of the chapter, but I think one of the major, like, you know, the major conclusion of this chapter, uh, at least as I understand it by, by McGowan, is that, you know, he's bringing up all of this stuff, you know, the sort of inherent, well, you know, he starts off with the the other, that is God, right? Talks about how freedom is just like this impoverished domain. And he talks about advertising and how God has this like sort of implication of being uh, like a, like an ad or like a commercial for a certain kind of being or like a certain kind of way of acting in the world, right? Through capitalism as like this market influence. And then he talks even about like how Adam Smith has this like glaring contradiction in his work about on the one hand, he's saying like stark self-interest is like the thing that should motivate people in our society. And then uh, in his other book, he talks about how there should be like a more of a like a network of compassion, I guess, uh, or that they are like basically not, he doesn't really implicate the self-interest in the same way. And so there's like kind of this problematic dimension that arises there um and he proposes that like the the idea of like the invisible hand of the market to like connect those things i think you mean the invisible hand job of the market yeah the invisible hand job of the market um and i think so then he says all of that to say this right the whole idea that he's trying to invoke here is that the situation that subjects find themselves in with regard to capitalism when it presents freedom to you in this particular kind of way is the domain of what we would call neuroticism and psychoanalysis right and that there is a certain demand of the other that we are trying to satisfy, but that in a sense, even when we think we've satisfied it, it cannot be satisfied because it just is like an impossible demand or it's like a demand that like literally doesn't exist. And the reason that that is, is because the other in this argument, right, has an unconscious. And that's what McGowan is arguing about the sort of nature of capitalism, that there is an unconscious operating in the background that makes it to where our engagement with, he makes a really good example actually, he makes the example of uh, like a school teacher and like having a classroom and having certain rules and like assignments and whatever, and there being like a student who thinks that they have figured out the desire of the school teacher and does all of the stuff that they're supposed to do, turns in all their assignments on time, like answers all the questions in class, is like, you know, straight A student, always there, you know, bringing the teacher gifts or whatever. And at the end of the day, the way that the teacher feels about that student is like, God, they're so fucking annoying. You know, like why, you know, like, like I don't care what you have to say, put your hand down, somebody else answer, please. You know, like it, it becomes this strange relationship of like, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to, but I'm never getting this, like the recognition from the, from the teacher. And so I think that um, in that sense, he's trying to say that there is an unconscious domain to capitalism that's that that is not being recognized when we engage in this certain form of freedom that we have to follow the other's desire in capitalism and so he's making the argument that 
we should recognize this in order to like not be distracted by the posturing of of the big other that is the market capital so i want to actually read kind of this is a paragraph i think it'll encapsulate a lot of this pretty well this is on 132 it's right under the section the other does exist he says and i and then i want to ask um what everyone thinks about this considering we've read about half of the book so far. He says, the fundamental project of psychoanalysis is its combat against the belief in the invisible hand. In psychoanalytic terms, the precise name for a believer in the invisible hand is neurotic. The neurotic seeks refuge from his or her own freedom in the idea of an other, capital O, who provides a hidden guidance for what the neurotic should desire. As long as God exists as a physical presence within the world directing desire, neurosis cannot develop. A guide for the subject's desire is clearly stated in the dictates of God, but when modernity eliminates God or consigns God to a spiritual realm, the subject turns toward a new other that exists only in its absence. This other, Smith's invisible hand of the market, tells the subject how to desire, and the subject who accepts this other becomes neurotic. The struggle against neurosis is thus the struggle against the underlying belief that sustains the capitalist economy. If we are all neurotic to some extent or another, this means that we all have some degree of investment in the capitalist system. So I kind of want to ask two questions on this. One, what everyone thinks of this explicit, I know like McGowan doesn't describe himself as a Marxist, but the idea of like the project of psychoanalysis is to subvert the operating of the invisible hand. I'm curious how everyone thinks of that as a definition of psychoanalysis. The other thing is, and you know, I know you've brought this up a couple of times, this idea that actually the capitalist subject par excellence today is the psychotic, as opposed to maybe the neurotic of a slightly earlier time in capitalist development, thinking about how would we compare the shift to maybe a psychotic psychic structure under capitalism versus a neurotic one. So those are like two things I'm curious to hear thoughts about. The psychotic today, like I think is best characterized under paranoia and fear of missing out is a, a great example of this, right? Like I hear a lot of young people will, will talk about that FOMO, right? I don't want I don't want to miss anything. Because I don't want to miss anything, they're 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 doing things. They're they're checking Instagram, they're they're listening to their podcasts or watching their YouTube channels. Like all this the stuff that they're doing, but it, it's a it's a paranoia based on this idea that it's possible to not miss out, which is ridiculous. If you're if you're doing something, you're not doing all the other things you could be doing. If you go to a restaurant, you order one thing on the menu, you don't order all the other stuff. So you are missing out on that other stuff. It might be better. It might not be. You don't know. Um, but they're so paranoid about that. I think that the, the neurotic, on the other hand, tries to find a way to say, like, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll order a bunch of appetizers in that way. <laughs> I, I get I get to experience a lot of different things just in smaller amounts or something. They're they're trying to find like a loophole ultimately, but they know fundamentally that it, it is not possible to do this. Uh, capitalism, I, I think, in the way that that it exists, really fan the fire that is this paranoia in people. It says, "Don't miss out." If you if you read the the latest book by Zizek, you know he writes like nine books in a month. Have you read the, the ninth one? <laughs> Um, because if you haven't read the ninth one, you're missing something. And, and it, it's just like, you can't do that, ultimately. They all um, say the same shit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> Different formulations of the You're not missing out on shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I would say. That the, the, other, uh, the last point I'll, I'll make with it, too, it, this is kind of piggybacking off where you're going before Adam, is that what psychoanalysis does, I mean, I, I think that McGowan doesn't in, in, like use this specifically, but there's the you know, four discourses and the discourse of the analyst as opposed to the discourse of the hysteric the master or the university or institution it is a very specific discourse because the analyst doesn't make demand, right? And in not making demands forces the the subject to choose something. And, and that that is a, a revolutionary act as opposed to the, the, the more capitalist. But I mean, there, there's also some interesting people who, who make some very great critiques of psychoanalysis and say that, you know, people pay money for psychoanalysis. So is it actually anti-capitalist and, and stuff like that? But anyways, I'm rambling. I'm going to kind of uh, maybe to follow up to Adam's question, like, would you agree with McGowan that the fundamental project is to combat the belief in the invisible hand if you see it as like psychotic instead of neurotic as the yeah like yeah the, the more powerful I, I would because the, the basically the the person comes to an analyst saying I've lost the invisible hand I don't know how it's directing me tell me what to do you know act as an agent of the 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 invisible hand be it make it, tell me get what's wrong with me give me a diagnosis etc right like there there's a, a demand that the subject makes to the analyst, which is, is to, to be the master, but the analyst doesn't do it. Um, the analyst does not play that game. They, the analyst consistently 
defers mastery and defers uh, these different things. Now, of course, the analyst does have knowledge, which is the repressed truth in the analyst's discourse. But the way in which they, they operate is to, to not give answers, to not give direction. And when they do that, it does theoretically, you know, force the subject to choose. Um, it, it's saying like, like, no, the invisible hand isn't going to choose for you. You must choose. You know, within the the conditions that you're in, you there's a certain range of options that you have available to you. You have to pick one because if you don't pick one, that's picking one. In in a way, the uh, both the psychotic and the neurotic would have a relation to the invisible hand. It's just slightly different how it plays out. The psychotic has a the mistaken belief that they can sort of uh, not miss out on the invisible hand. I guess right, like that they they're paranoid that they might lose it. I, I think. Or the neurotic recognizes that it's it's invisible, which means that they're not going to see it, but they're going to kind of do their best, you know, to sort of figure out where it is and act in accordance. <laughs> Alex, go for it. Okay, okay, I, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, this is this is great though. This is like okay, really yeah. excellent topic I think for discussion. Yeah. I mean, I would just say like my my perspective on like kind of this idea. And there's two things I want to say. On on the one hand, in response to your your question about the difference between the neurotic and the the psychotic, I would just say like the neurotic position for me is like, or at least like kind of my understanding of it or the best way that I could try to conceive of it is that there's a a degree to which as opposed to the hysteric who is always just like questioning why is that I'm in the position that you try to put me in kind of, you know, like what, what is it about you that makes me have to be what I am, you know? And so it's like this question about the desire of the other, like, why am I the thing that you call me kind of ideals like sort of in, invokes that like interpolation idea a little bit and I hate that fucking word Don. <laughs> Don's but, favorite uh, word right there <laughs> Don's favorite word ladies and gentlemen ding ding we found it um, but like but the neurotic does the opposite the neurotic is trying to neutralize it's a neurotic yeah, huh? it's a form of neurosis. Yeah, right. But I'm talking. I guess I'm maybe I'm talking about like obsessional neuro- neuroticism as opposed to like. But, but, uh, I guess, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the confusing thing because the obsessional and the hysteric are both specific forms of a, of a neurotic structure, right? Yeah, I was just trying to say. So, like, on the one hand, right? So they although they share the same structure, there's a different relation to the big other, right? There's like. It, for the obsessional neurotic, it's something that you are trying, there's something that you're trying to neutralize in the way that the big other has desires so that you can not feel like you are beholden to their desire. So like the understanding of the market and the way that the market has a certain kind of logic to it allows you to feel like you aren't tortured by this question of what should I be in your eyes? but rather you have some basis for engaging with that same kind of desire, but like with a certain internal logic to it added. Whereas the psychotic, I would say, is somebody who is taking way too seriously or like believing wholeheartedly the logic, the internal logic of the market and accepting that they are exactly how they see themselves defined in that logic and acts in a different way and because of that. With the neurotic, right, subject, whether they're hysteric or obsessional, there's always a doubting or a certain way in which they don't feel like they're at home in what they have identified about the other's desire. Whereas the psychotic does, in a sense, feel that that is their their chosen path and that they have to enact it fully. I don't know if that helps in any way, but I just wanted to like put my two cents in about how I would think through that. So that's interesting, Alex, because I, I, I would say that it's about the real in, in this too, right? Like the way that the neurotic versus the psychotic defend themselves against the real is is interesting. So the psychotic defends themselves against the real by foreclosing. They don't believe they're vulnerable, essentially. And they, and they have different delusional structures that they create, which are going to be you know somewhat unique. But the, the commonality in the delusional structure is that they they believe that they they are the law, right? Like they're not subjects of the law, they, they are it. Um, they're not castrated, they're, they're the exception. And that's, I think, their way of dealing with the trauma of the real and, and, and the touch of the real when they experience it. I think the neurotic, on the other hand, develops a fantasy and a way to cope with the, the touch of the real and, and the sort of like impingement of the, the real in their lives. And the fantasy gets the job done, but if you push on it with a neurotic as opposed to a psychotic, they will be like, yeah, it's, I know it's not real, but it, it makes me feel better ultimately, right? I use this example sometimes and I teach about this. When Before we had our, our, our son, my wife and I, she was 
overdue by like two weeks. And so when you're, you're that overdue, you go to the doctor like every day and they, they do these different measurements to figure out if they're going to send you to the hospital to have labor induced. Every time we went to the doctor, we took uh, our hospital bag with us. And then one day we were going to go and we were kind of getting sick and tired of going to the doctor and not going to the hospital. And I don't I, I think that I said this, I was like, I said to Tracy, my wife, I'm like, we should not bring the hospital bag because if we don't bring it, then they'll send us to the hospital. <laughs> right. And this, yeah. this is like a neurotic fantasy in that moment if somebody would to say to me, like, Neil, do you actually think there's any correlation between the presence of the hospital bag and what the doctor's going to find when they measure whatever? I'd be like, no, of course I don't think that <laughs> that's dumb, but it's fun. You know, it's, it's, and it gives me a, a semblance of control in, in, in a fantastical way. The psychotic, I would argue, in that situation would be like, no, yeah, absolutely. If I don't bring this bag, we're going. <laughs> and they'd, they'd buy that. Like, they'd think that they have that control in a sense. It's an interesting example to think about the relationship for the neurotic, the sort of the primary mechanism or operation of grappling with the real is repression, right? And so whenever you were describing, let's say, like the kind of common or let's say the, I don't know, the psychic structure most engendered by capitalism now is psychotic and it's defined by uh, paranoia. I mean, I guess like another way I was thinking about that is that whenever foreclosure happens as an operation in psychosis, the idea is, is that you're sort of foreclosing that something is internal in your own psychic operations and it gets completely displaced onto the external and then it sort of terrorizes you, encroaches upon you as if it was from the outside. And so I was thinking about for McGowan and how we're talking about this, is the paranoia that something outside of us is saying, no, you must enjoy, like we all are enjoying, you must be enjoying too. Is that how you think about paranoia there, Neil? Versus like, you know, the idea of like, there's a big other out there, something out there that's like watching me and is like terrorizing me from the outside. I'm trying to think about that as it relates to like enjoyment. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a really good read on that. I think that, that there's this, and this actually ties to something you said earlier, mm -hmm. I think too. And I'm, I'm so tired. So I'm trying to keep this thread. <laughs> I know, um, we're all, no, we're all just like dragging ass into the here. end of this. <laughs> when you were asking about the symbolic, you know, when, when an analyst intervenes in an analytic session, they do so by speaking uh, words. They say things. They, they, they use the symbolic in their, their interventions. They speak. What they're doing when that, like, if you, you kind of look at, like, the late Lacan, the Borromean Clinic version of, of Lacan, what that stuff is getting into is the way that an analyst or really anybody can use a symbolic intervention, can use words that are spoken or written. And in so doing, the, those, those words cut away the jouissance that the person feels in relation to what they're doing, right? So if somebody wants to, for example, think that they're being really anti-capitalist because they're buying a lot of books that are written by Marxists and anarchists and other people like that, uh, if an intervent uh, somebody could say like you do realize that you are buying those books, which is a total participation in the capitalist system. If that verbal intervention worked, it, it could cut away the enjoyment that that subject feels in buying the book. The jouissance of it would be uh, less there. It would be cut away to to some degree. And, and I think that that's kind of what what McGowan is trying to do with this book is he's trying to implicate people. Uh, in a specific way, which isn't saying like you're a bad person or you're a good person. It's just saying like you're a person who exists in capitalism. And as a person who exists in capitalism, you enjoy certain things. It's implicating us in that enjoyment. And that implication has an effect, I would argue, on the jouissance that comes with it ultimately. Uh, and that, that, so that's, I think that that applies to something you were saying before. And then with what you, you just brought up now, I think the paranoia that subjects feel now, they are enjoying their paranoia. There, there's an enjoyment in it. It's like the, the kind of like uh, chronically checking social media, the chronically um, being up to date on whatever it is that you're into. The um, person who's always looking at stock tickers, trying to figure out what's going to happen and to like be ahead of, buy a penny stock they're going to be able to sell for five bucks in two weeks or, or you know. All of those things are examples of the paranoia that, that I would see in society today. I was going to bring back, because uh, towards towards the end of this this section, McGowan is talking about, he's kind of criticizing Foucault. Thank you. Bit. I was hoping <laughs> we were going to read this part. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I think this act, like like ties really in deeply to maybe one of your older questions, Don, about like capitalism as like a repressive domain. Um, sort of like that, that argument that Foucault might make of like, there's sort of like some prohibitions there or like, yeah, like that there, there's a repression of the subject that's required in order for them to fit 
fit into the capitalist dynamic. And uh, McGowan's kind of trying to highlight a way that that kind of misses part of what might actually be. You know, I think that you and I both have the same quote uh, <laughs> marked here. Right? It's, like, yeah, uh, it's at yeah, the yeah. bottom of 133. Yeah. So basically it says that Foucault's critique misses another possible link between capitalism and neurosis. Mm-hmm. And it says capitalism doesn't feed the neurotic subject through its repressiveness, but through its capacity for fostering the illusion that the other exists. Uh, the basis of neurosis is not just the repression of sexual desire and its replacement with a symptom, but the belief in the substantial existence of the other. The belief that a self-identical social authority can issue clear demands uh, that solve the problems of subjectivity and freedom. And then, yeah, neurosis is dependence on an external authority that enables the subject to avoid taking responsibility for its own acts. I, I know that he's just like sort of deploying a criticism of Michel Foucault, but I, I think that it still ties into like what we're talking about here that like in a sense, um, understanding the idea of like neurosis in the subject is just a way of like bringing attention to the way that repression can also appear as like freedom. Basically, I think that's like the whole point of this chapter is that like um, the thing that we're calling freedom is in a sense a kind of repression but um, not like the old type of like police officer repressing you or like you know pu- you know punishing you for doing the wrong thing. But yeah, it's not Kamala Harris. Right, it's not Kamala Harris like <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> canvassing door to door with a SWAT team. <laughs> you know, like, uh, <laughs> rather a different uh, an, a repression that invites you to enjoy yourself uh, in all the ways that it says enjoyment is good. Yeah, actually, I mean, I don't know if we want to deal with him now. I had more questions about free. Two. Okay. I mean, we're um, pretty much at the end of this chapter, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I think this is pretty much, that's it. So when we're going to, to return to the conversation we had way at the beginning, when we're just talking about like how he understands freedom and how we define freedom, is there the possibility that a limit can be made by God or the capitalist system that cannot be challenged or transgressed by the individual? <laughs> That's a good. That's a good question. I mean, you're asking me like what I think. Or well, I mean, what? what I well, both, I guess. Yeah. Is there a limit that cannot be transgressed by the, the and a limit imposed by capitalism that cannot be transgressed by the? Individual? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess the implication is by capitalism, but I would say by by anything. I mean, I think earlier we were we were saying that the limit is required, right, in order for freedom to exist. But there are parts in this chapter that I got the impression that actually capitalism is capable of imposing a limit that actually just seems to rob people of their freedom entirely. It's interesting, right? Because I think that it's in a sense maybe trying to redirect our efforts at maybe not so much disengaging with the things that we desire, but rather recognizing how those things are already in some way functioning that they, they could be conceived as functioning for us or functioning towards satisfying our desire, but maybe we're perceiving them in a certain format that's not allowing us to receive that like sort of satisfaction those things are supposed to give us i don't necessarily like align with that but i kind of feel like maybe that's the implication that you're Hmm. that you're referring to or maybe an implication that um, mcgowan is making about that same idea that there's a a certain yeah like i was saying before there's a certain kind of horizon that you get locked into in capitalism that doesn't really allow you the freedom to like operate outside of it or the freedom to express the way that you're engaged with it yeah, in common kind of, parlance, you know, but like you kind of have to like really think about this in an obtuse way to be able to see the way that it implicates you no matter what you do. But I don't think that that's necessarily to imply that there is an absolute limit and you just can't get out of it and capitalism is like the name of the game for the rest of eternity or something. I think mm-hmm. it's more like trying to see that if you conceive of it in a certain kind of way, it does implicate you to that degree but that there are possibilities for relating to it differently that obviously like, you know, an analysis, like if you went one-on-one with someone and you told them about what things you felt like were limitations in your life, like an analyst might be able to clarify for you that those things aren't actually limitations, but rather the space through which you can engage in a meaningful way with your life or what it is that you desire. Like similarly, I think McGowan is trying to like disambiguate this for the purposes of letting us see the way that we actually do have access to the universal, the thing that capitalism is sort of standing be- like between us and give us some, some maybe possible ways of thinking of like stepping outside of it. Um, I don't think he does it quite as explicitly as like maybe like Zupanchich did, <laughs> like what is mm-hmm. sex by like, you know, I almost like went, went right back and quoted that Zupanchich line again of like, it's on 117, that which can in no way be reduced without abolishing ethics as such is not the multicolored variability of every situation, but the gesture by which every subject by means of his action posits the universal performs a certain operation of universalization. So there, it's not, it's not a foreclosing of like everything 
to capital, right? It, it's just, there's a way in which you could conceive of it where that might happen. But like there is still an openness, like as subject, you still have access to that, that universal thing that would give you a way of reconceptualizing your engagement and what's important and like operating in a sense outside of the domain of what the market of capital defines for you to be the domain you should operate in. Will it be what you think it's going to be? Will it be fun? Will it be good? Will it be like liberating? (laughs) Hell the fuck no. Like it's definitely not going to be right. Like it's going to be an abyssal domain of like uncertainty and like monstrosity. Right. But like there is still access that can be had. And it just, you know, requires you to to recognize the way that in a sense you are having your sense of responsibility be sort of vouched for by capitalism and say like, hey, don't worry, we're taking care of it for you by developing, you know, systems of like (laughs) mass incarceration around the world and like, you know, weapons and satellite systems to support those weapons. Yeah, really quickly, I would just say that the whole point that I think McGowan's intervention is trying to do is to get you to um, stop letting capitalism cuck all your universals. (laughs) <laughs> Expand, please. Well, I mean, it's, it's, so okay. So that's 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 obviously live shit posting, but I I do think it's kind of a, an implication of Zupanchich is the idea that like what Alex is saying that the way that this functions and what. McGowan's trying to disambiguate is that capital stands in place of the universal. In some sense, like Zupanchich's intervention is to say what the whole point of the psychoanalytic kind of critique is about is to get you to recognize that underneath all things that stand in for authority for the other, all things that help you escape from that sort of impossible domain of the fact that you're a fractured subject, you're a barred subject, right? Like, I think the idea is, is that it's precisely the fact that you have an unconscious It is precisely the fact that you're structured in this way by the symbolic order, by the social conditions around you. This is the very thing that gives you the potential to act in a radical way that allows you to be able to use your understanding of that to then trans, like to actually choose to transgress the limit in a certain way. And I think at least for Zupanchich, my understanding is that her idea of like Kant and ethics is that To act in that way is, in fact, to wrestle back access to the universal in the very nature of being a subject and and recognizing how all this shit functions. And I think the idea is that by not recognizing this, and the whole point of psychoanalysis is to get us to recognize this in the political domain for someone like Supantrish is to say, we are actually evacuating our possibility to posit universals as subjects and basically just displacing that back into capital or to the social order as a whole. That's my understanding of it. So, I mean, whenever I say capitalism is cutting your universals, what I mean is, is that it's, it's a way that we're not even aware that we're evacuating this radical potential we have as subjects to kind of be inherently disruptive to capital. I think in a way. Uh, can we talk about like a specific? <laughs> no. <laughs> but no, we can't talk about it. I'm not going to explain yeah. any of that. Going back to his discussion of careers and occupations and stuff. I have a friend from, from many years ago from, from high school that he really wanted to do is he really wanted to be uh, a musician and play the uh, cello, right? Uh, and he spent a shitload of time doing it, put a lot of effort into it, but couldn't end up doing it because there's just not enough careers out there to do it yeah uh, it was like not enough like demand basic, for chess. yeah yeah there's just like not a demand for that i think that this is would be a way in right in which we would say that capitalism like and this is one of kind of the specific limits that i think mcgowan was talking about the ways in which capitalism limits people's lives it was like a limit that was placed on what he wanted to do he wasn't the or you know like the the career that he wanted wasn't wasn't open to him is the argument that he had a choice there that he could just basically be like no fuck you i'm gonna try and do it anyway and just basically not have a career and live <laughs> have no money and live poor for the rest of my life or like i mean i don't know like it's just hard that's what to- i did <laughs> hell yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but i mean i was saying that that's a legitimate a legitimate choice and i don't know like i think that a lot of this i'm gonna say kind of again comes back to the real and this is this is something we haven't spent a lot of time developing it really wasn't a big part of this chapter that's probably one of the reasons why but um your friend if he didn't live in a capitalist system if he lived in you know a feudal system or he lived in the the soviet union i would argue that that his chances of making you know a, a profession out of paying the cello i don't know how improved they would have been I agree, yeah, and that was part of my one, yeah, when I talked about it earlier about whether we imagined these options being open for us under something like feudalism and under the, yeah, under God, yeah, so I would agree with you. But this is the real, though, is what I'm getting at, right? Like, the the real 
is the this thing and it, it's it's kind of hard to talk about we can't really talk about it we can maybe talk around it but we're limited and one of the biggest ways that we're limited is is that we die and we don't know what happens after that right like i mean we don't know capitalism i think right now <laughs> interestingly i see different things that that i i'm really fascinated by because i think capitalism is trying to fight the real in where by creating some kind of post death future uh, you know, put, this is what the singularity people like Ray Kurzweil, you know, I'll download my brain to a computer and then after my body dies, I'll continue to live kind of kind of thing. The real uh, and, and all that it implies, the castration that is death of, of the body is a limit. And it is it is a limit that means that we must make choices in how we take whatever amount of life we have and live it like there is no getting out of that. You, you choose because there is that limit. You don't know exactly when that's going to be, right? Or most people don't know exactly when they're going to die. But but we all know that we do. We do know that the limit's there. And because the limit's there, it creates the vitality of, of life itself. If, if that limit wasn't there, it's kind of hard to imagine what that would look like because no one's ever had it. We can only imagine it, right? We, we don't know. Uh, but this is one of those things. I think that capitalism and, and Christianity in some ways, both offer a psychotic reaction to, to the real. It's different, but it, it seems like they could both be psychotic. They could also both offer neurotic reactions to the, to the real as well. But uh, uh, that's something that I see. But that, that your, your question about a hard limit, when you asked it, that's what I thought of was the, was the real. You know, the, the real as the hard limit. Par excellence, right? That just, it, It's a non-negotiable that it, there's, there's no way around it. So that was going to be my serious thing. My non-serious... Yeah, what's your yeah. shit post, yeah. Neil? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Here's my shit post. Um, yeah. You should put like some, I'm grabbing my gun. I'm going to do some shots fired here. So you should put like sound effects <laughs> of a, a gun being loaded here. What I, we can I do would that. like somebody to do, I can't do this because I don't have this the, the skill or the time to do this. But I think if somebody were to take a, a picture of Todd McGowan, when he's not wearing a hat and uh, Photoshop it into a movie poster that made it look like he was starring as Michelle Foucault in a biopic about Michelle Foucault. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Do you think that's like a weird reason why he like is so critical of Foucault, why he has this like deeply critical response to him? It's just really, it's too, like, it's too close. Yeah, it's kind of like, he, you know, you react most strongly against the thing that's closest to you, you know? <laughs> I'm going to show you that like a serious question. No, I don't think that's the that's issue. I think it's <laughs> totally different than that. But. Well, I was going to say he's like, he's like bizarro world Michel Foucault. You know, he's like the Foucault from another dimension or vice versa. Yeah. So it would be great. Like if we could do that movie poster, just a, a picture of, of Todd McGowan, you know, start in, in Foucault and then have like different people saying, you know, like McGowan's portrayal of Foucault is so spot on it's hey, so great hey neil have you seen that meme where it's uh, it's from some action movie but it's like a guy with like a machine gun like an mp5 or something he's like coming out of a car and he's a like just bald white guy with glasses he looks just like michelle foucault and so what people have done is they photoshop <laughs> that picture onto the cover of discipline and punish so what i'm going to propose that we do is we photoshop mcgowan's face onto that guy who's the ringer of michelle foucault but then we photoshop that onto discipline and punish. <laughs> pure baudrillard to, to follow up to your your serious response um would you say that this is in your understanding though this wouldn't have been a limit that was placed on by capitalism like my my buddies and that wouldn't be what mcgowan is or do, do you interpret that as what mcgowan's saying as a limit of capitalism or i i had to think about it but i, I, I don't I, think it, it is all a limit of capitalism yeah personally. i, I, I want to respond to that okay, because yeah. i feel like what your friend was going through with like wanting to be a cellist and kind of recognizing that that's not necessarily in the cards or whatever mm -hmm. it isn't so much that like capitalism both made your friend desire to be a cellist and then also simultaneously denied mm -hmm. that he could be one. It's more like your friend's ultimatum that capitalism was like presenting him with was like either put your fucking money where your mouth is and like go ahead and try to be the damn cellist even if it like ruins your whole life or like you just end up in poverty alone, mm -hmm. you know, when it's all over or recognize that that's not what you really want to be and do something else. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of forces you into the like the either or of I can either pursue my passions like deeply because I think this is what I was supposed to do and like I think that there's hope that I can accomplish it or you're just like forced to reconsider whether that would be practical and like 
it's not the same thing as like the implication of like faithful God, which would tell you like, no, there's really only one way that you can be faithful. And maybe one of these ways is like evil or one of these ways is good. Mm -hmm. And you got to do the good one. It's more like being like, eh, you know, like if you want to really dedicate yourself to being a cellist for the rest of your life, go for it. The path is there for you to go on. But if you kind of feel like that's going to, you know, not be something that you're, you know, willing to like do, then here's here's the more practical way of going about it. And like your desire is not just like completely dismissed and has nowhere to go, but rather will just be redirected. And so it's, there's kind of, there's a, this, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but there's a movie that I watched again after not having watched it for a really long time. Interesting movie. It's called Black Irish. There's a scene. It's got Brendan Gleeson in it. Anyway, good movie. Whatever. Maybe look it up. It's like Brendan Gleeson is his father. <laughs> yeah, Vin, Vin Diesel. Diesel. <laughs> yeah, that's who it is. <laughs> Not fucking Vin Diesel. Uh, <laughs> I remember Vin Diesel. I just can't remember this kid's name. Basically, Brendan Gleeson plays the the kid's father, and like the kid goes out to hang out with his friends all night. It actually was a horrible night for him. Like they ended up breaking into a house and drinking all their alcohol, and then he comes home. And he realizes he forgot to feed his rabbit who ha or uh, give medicine to his rabbit that has like a, some condition that he needs to get medicine every day. And his rabbit ends up dying. And so he kind of like sees his rabbit die when he gets home. And then he walks in in the morning and he's like kind of pouting, you know, that like his rabbit died. And then he walks in and sits, you know, he says hi to his dad or something. And he's kind of like crying about his rabbit dying. And his dad kind of smells the alcohol on his breath. And it's Brendan Gleeson. And it's like totally like i don't know like misogynistic thing that he says like he basically is like well you either cry like a woman or you drink like a man he's like you can't have it both ways right and he's like like oh well if you want to live that life of like going out staying out late and getting drunk well then i'm going to give you the opportunity right now to like prove that that's what you want to do and so he reaches in the like, liquor cabinet and he pulls out a bottle of liquor and he pours him a shot and pours himself a shot and he drinks the shot and he's like go ahead and then like uh, i want to say his name's like michael anguro or something i can't remember the if his name anyway it doesn't matter but like he he like goes to try to take the shot <laughs> sorry he goes to try to take the shot and it like you know obviously overwhelms him and he goes he throws up in the sink and his dad's kind of like yeah like you know you're not man enough to like live that life where you just like drink every night and like you know and he's like obviously implying like i am you know like i did choose that shitty life and so don't do what i did but it's like very much an instance of like defining the other's desire right like you know, his dad is being like, oh, so you want to be like a tough guy, basically, but like you're in here crying about your fucking rabbit. Go ahead and drink and see what it's really like. And so I kind of feel like similarly to your friend with his cello dreams, right? It's like, oh, you want to be a cellist, huh? <laughs> like, okay, if you want to be a cellist, then you got to like fucking like take your damn shots and like do, you know, do the thing. And it's going to suck and you're not going to like it. And like, this is what it really is to be a cellist. You know, it just presents you back with the same stark reality of like, this is the option. This, this is, these are the paths that you have to go down. Like pick the one you want. That's the freedom that I'm giving you. It's very similar. Like I feel like in the book, but there, there, there is a freedom offered though. Then, right? Yeah. Yeah. A free, a quote unquote freedom. Right. <laughs> right? A freedom I mean, that's to all, choose between all freedom is quote unquote for I, me, but yeah, go ahead. Sure. I get that. And like, I think, <laughs> but like, I think this, so like he talks about that, scene from fucking the stupidest book i can't god damn it the great, great gatsby. gatsby like i'm fucking i don't care yeah. about that book worth a shit but like all i'm saying I is questions like, about that book but we're not gonna get to yeah. maybe not but like i'm just saying that one scene that he yeah. calls upon right where like there's that billboard mm -hmm. of the the glasses doctor or whatever the optometrist <laughs> glasses doctor <laughs> optometrist like, that's what, those, I don't that's what those people are called <laughs> the glasses doctor um and like it's basically just a giant billboard of like spec the spectacled eyes like looking out and there's sort of this whatever these characters are just like oh shit you know like god sees everything he, he makes that quote like uh god sees everything and then the neighbor replies mm -hmm. that's just an advertisement so it's like you either still have the ability to believe in like that old world God of like, oh, I really do have a purpose or like there are things that I have to use as directives in my life. Or you can also like take the bait and say like, no, nah, it's just, you know, it doesn't really matter like what God thinks. But like you're still kind of in a sense implicated to acknowledge those principles and make decisions based on whether or not you agree with them or not. So it's like the difference between the God that truly sees all and the God that just like puts up a billboard that he's watching, but he's not actually really watching. And you kind of know that he's not really watching, but that you're still implicated both ways to do the same thing, you know, like in both domains. I was looking this up, actually, this is a, this is a weird association. I wanted to get, make sure I got it right though. But when uh, <laughs> Alex talked about Shit. the cello. <laughs> uh -huh. This is the thing that comes to my mind. Demolition Man. The, the the Wesley Snipes Sylvester Stallone movie. There, there's mm -hmm. a sign. There's this part in it where uh, Stallone says to, to this guy, "You're gonna regret the rest of your life, both seconds of it." 
<laughs> I love that line. What, what a classic <laughs> film. It's, a good, it's, it's a good one. so good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not, but it, it's it's bad in the way that I love. So Agreed. It's just like, I mean, I, I'm imagining that, right? Like, somebody's just like, I'm really sad because, like, I can't do the thing that I want to do. It's like, you're going to regret your life. <laughs> The rest of your life, both seconds. <laughs> I, I, I will say though, I'm going to be haunted for the rest of the the next few weeks until we do our our sixth episode by the phrase "cello dreams." <laughs> cello dreams. <laughs> that, that, just, that was so poetic and also just yeah. bizarre to me. I was just yeah, like, yeah. that could be like a teenage anime, as far as I'm concerned. Mm, yeah, but cello then, dreams. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's so good. Or that, a weird visual like, novel. Yeah. Huh? Or, Somebody weird. should be writing you a check yeah. right now. Yeah, that's it. Chapter five of Plowing with McGowan in the books. It's wrapped up. It's to be no more. Well, actually, that's not true, because as I said at the beginning, if you'd like even more of the Red Troika's thoughts, reflections, icy cold analysis, spicy takes on chapter five, head over to Patreon. Again, that's www.patreon.com slash Red Library Podcast. Join in the army, the Red Library Army faction, the Relaf. For a dollar a month, you'll get access to our extra Prime Director's Cut on Plowing with McGowan Chapter 5 and all the other spicy content that we're offering our patrons. Next week, speaking of which, we're going to have our patron-only release, a very, very special one. No spoilers just yet, but if you're on the Discord, you know what's coming. And then after that, we're going to move into September and we have an incredible lineup of new guests, of new content. We're going to expand into some new areas, tackle some new subjects, and I cannot wait. As always, in the meantime, until we see you back here next week, stay motivated, stay hydrated, stay liberated, stay emancipated, stay deracinated. Actually, I don't even know what that means. Keep dreaming of those lost futures, comrades, because we're trying to do the same thing here. And remember the ultimate dialectical pessimist question. What if we die? Well, what if we fucking live? Your comrades here at Red Library, all across the Lost Horizons podcasting network, we out here. Take care of yourselves. Peace.